I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts, And on this episode, an attempt to recreate a concert of peace and love turns into a disaster of resentment and destruction. We'll talk about the Netflix documentary series, Trainwreck, Woodstock 99. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, host of These Are Their Stories podcast, and the front man of Bush, Gavin Rossdale. Hello, Gavin. Hello, Rebecca. (laughs) Just kidding. It's my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Yes, and. (laughs) Yes, but you weren't British enough. So British enough. (laughs) I'm sorry. Also with us. No, he's posh British. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of Dead on Deadline, and the forthcoming The Five. Final Curtain, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Hello, Rebecca. And finally, our resident Doubting Thomas, author of the City Trilogy, host of Strange Arrivals, and our very own Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hey, Rebecca. All right. So, Kevin, uh, clearly we are still a weekly podcast, not of a twice weekly podcast, at least until after Labor Day. What is coming up on next Monday's show? We're going to be talking about the new podcast series for Mark Smerling, who did Crime Town and did The Jinx. It's called Crooked City, Youngstown, Ohio. Crooked City? Mm-hmm. That's like Crime Town, but like a slightly different twist. It's just a, yes. it's just a Jim Trafficant thing. It is. It is. Yes. Nice. Who's Jim Trafficant? You'll just have to listen. Okay. When I was in D.C. with Congressional Quarterly, he was probably the biggest character as a congressman. Oh. Okay. And I assume that's what this thing is going to be about. His backstory is nuts. Wild. I can't, I can't wait to hear that. And also want to let you know that on Friday... We have an event for our Dallas adjacent listeners. We are going to be doing a meetup, Rebecca and I, six o'clock at Atlas. It's in the very trendy Bishop Arts section of town. So uh, meet us there at Atlas and we'll have a drink. All right. So, Kevin, we have a lot of like reminiscing to do from our like Gen X experiences. So I think Mm -hmm. we should just get right into it. What do you think? Sure. I'm going to go ahead and drop that first clip right now. Uh, Everyone said, no fucking way. That's a bad idea. But John has stepped in to overrule the entire board and saying, well, I'm the CEO, we're doing this. So we were left with doing Woodstock again. Organizers of Woodstock 99 set out to recreate the vibe of the original concert, all while turning a profit. But the three-day festival was beset by broken toilets, contaminated water, endless garbage, and corporate sponsors price gouging the concert goers. This isn't what Woodstock was supposed to be. We thought it was going to be this beautiful thing. Meanwhile, the organizers failed to appreciate their headline acts were thrash rock bands who whipped up the oversexed, overdrugged audience into a frenzy, which culminated in a fiery riot. There were people hanging from the speaker towers. It was like, like Planet of the Apes. Once you become part of a herd, you become like animals. And all of these people were acting like animals. 
The Netflix documentary series Trainwreck, Woodstock 99, replays the music festival catastrophe through the eyes of staff, musicians, and concertgoers. This docuseries goes behind the scenes to reveal the greed, naivete, and music that fueled three days of utter chaos. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Trainwreck, Woodstock 99. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. Additional note, I am the host of Netflix's You Can't Make This Up podcast, and I interviewed the director of Trainwreck. However, I promise you that has not influenced my review. Laura Bricker, you think the title of this documentary is appropriate. How come? It's like, you know, when you're going by a car crash and you just can't look away, even though, you know, you shouldn't look at it, but you keep looking anyway. That's sort of how I felt watching this entire documentary. I'm like, oh, fuck. Oh, oh, that's awful. Oh, shit. Oh, E, ah, E, and the whole time. But yet I kept watching it because it was so, I had to. (laughs) It was like a train wreck that I couldn't look away from. So yes, aptly titled. Not hard to come up with that title, I think, because it, it kind of like fits this so well. But, you know, it's just this thing was doomed from the start. And the way that the clips and this was set up, the, the video clips and the, the historical footage, it was just equal parts entertainment slash horror slash what the fuck. How many times did you all say what the fuck while you were watching this? Yeah. Laura, uh, I'm not giving away any secrets because this was in all the trade press, but the uh, working title for this. The original title. The original title up until the last minute was Clusterfuck Woodstock 99. (laughs) That's right. Was it really? It was. That fits. Oh, yeah. No, that totally that totally fits. Okay. Yeah. So, Toby, a big theme of this documentary is the sort of aura of toxic masculinity around this era and around the attendees of this festival. What do you think about that? I mean, is this all about like too many bros being like way too broed up? I mean, is that like a big part of what was going on here? Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. I mean, it seems like just an enormous frat party in which they got like these thrash bands that were like the last bands, like their music is sort of extremely aggressive, especially with Limp Biscuit. The guy is like too much of an idiot to understand what he's doing, you know, with this huge crowd. The whole conception of the thing just seems horrible and predictable what was going to happen. And I feel like you could even tell from the very beginning when people are walking in and it's like, there's just a lot of loaded dudes showing up and they're going to be here for 72 hours and there's basically just going to be getting continuously more loaded. What do you expect is going to happen? Because it doesn't have the cultural, like I think in Woodstock, like the original one in 1969, there was this sort of, I think because of the Vietnam war and the fact that people feared being drafted and being sent over, I think there was sort of a different sense of community and a different, you know, maybe seriousness of purpose or something which in 1999, apparently there wasn't any of that shit no. because those people were just showing up to get fucking bombed and have a good time at a show. And when you get that many people, I mean, we'll talk about this later, but it's a shown thing that you kind of lose your sense of, of individuality and a crowd will allow you to do things where if you weren't in this kind of crowd, you wouldn't do. And when you have a couple hundred thousand people in that same mindset, like bad shit's going to happen. Listen, I'm not afraid to just throw it out there. I mean, this is a largely white crowd, right? Mm -hmm. And 1999 was a a unique moment in time. Uh, It was at the end of a decade of prosperity. It was pre 9-11. I think the series does a really good job pointing out the pop culture moment, right? It's sort of like the grunge rock, you know, era underscored by all this pop culture shit that is really highlighting and glorifying toxic masculinity. All the comedy Mm -hmm. is of like the American pie variety, which let's be real. I thought that money the movie was funny, but like, it's also super gross. And that was the dominant like pop culture conversation. Combine that with like, Dudes who can drive and 15 year old girls who are lying to their parents to go to a concert at an abandoned Air Force base. 
<laughs> it's not even a bucolic setting. Kevin, they had an Air Force Base component of it. Like, I understand the promoters are like, yeah. we need infrastructure. By the way, it's just like Wild Wild Country. Like, we need infrastructure. But at least they actually built their own infrastructure in Wild Wild Country, right? This was an abandoned air. I love this scene where they show up in the, and they're just like, oh, my God, it's all asphalt. Like, this isn't good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of the... Th- <sighs> Some of the stuff just seemed like it was really great conceptually. They're trying to learn from their mistakes of the past, the little mistakes they made about profitability and things about having enough space and yada, yada. It's built on a bit of hubris and naivete on the part of the organizers. Now, we could talk about the responsibility of the concert goers that trash the place, and I think we will. But it's these organizers who thought they could like recreate their great gift to society, Woodstock. And they don't think they really understood how the times had changed or what a different generation would want or expects. A lot of the magic of Woodstock, you know, like Toby says, kind of happened organically, and the people arrived at this one already expecting drugs and free love, and it went from there. And sort of that's the original sin of Woodstock 99. They attempted to have the magic of Woodstock and securing corporate sponsorship. So it seems like you could do one, but not do both. And they had too little magic and too little money, so they weren't able to establish either. Yeah. So I will say one thing. Woodstock, the original Woodstock. And Laura, I don't know if you know people who talk about the original Woodstock. Oh, I do. They're not talking about what they experienced. They're mostly talking about the legend and the memories of what they experienced. Mm -hmm. The legend and the memories. And I think there was more of a social statement about people that were going to Woodstock based on what was happening in the country at the time. Correct. So like most of them were probably peeing in a mud pit and like they were super high. They don't remember a ton of it, but they're talking about the memory and it's like the amplified memory and trying to recreate that is literally impossible. Well, they're talking about the amplified memory, but let's just say that, Yes, they're out in like a muddy field and people are like pissing and having sex all over the place. But that was more like peace, love, music, where this one is like rape, arson, people driving vans through crowds, um, people drinking water that's like coming from the porta potties. I mean, it's it's just a whole and the music was so angry at this one. I mean, you have the guy from the Red Hot Chili Peppers on stage, like totally naked, like oh, shaking his good old pee-pee flea. around. I'm like, I did not need to say that. Non-consensual peen. That's what he was all about. There's so much nudity in this this documentary. You have people up there on stage just contributing to that sort of toxic environment. Whereas like the original one, yes, it's about the nostalgia and it's about the memory, but you weren't hearing the same sort of horror stories that you're hearing out of this one. And I think that the concert goers that went to this one you've got a a lot more of a sense of entitlement of the people we paid for this. We're not going to pick up the trash when the lady comes around in her little golf cart. Like, please help. Great scene. Please help. Trash bags in your area. Come on, everybody help out. One person said to me, I paid $150 to be here. You should clean it up. And I said, well, this is a different kind of woodstock. Laura, I think that sums up so almost everything. That this clash between the boomers who have this idealism about what Woodstock is and the magic of Woodstock is going to rain like pixie dust and change all these people. And these millennials who here are like, hey, man, I paid 150 bucks to be here. Fuck you and pick up your own trash. I completely fucking disagree with your categorization of generations that way. I think the boomers were fucking greedy. And completely. Oh, you're, now, ho- you're, no, now you're doing it. I completely disagree with your characterization of generational like the boomers here in this in this These situation boomers, yes. were greedy and corporatizing a memory that was like false and didn't exist. And they held a concert on a decommissioned Air Force base and charged children one hundred and fifty dollars to be there. And then children and, and young people showed up. And there was zero expectation for them that it was a community. They thought they were going to experience is it the fire festival. They thought they were paying for something and they were going to receive something in return. And I think that it wasn't just millennials, by the way. It was also plenty of Gen X people, by the way. Like, let's not like blame entitled. I don't think these concert goers like I, I blame the organizers for this. I think you are completely off in terms of like calling I, the I boomers blame both. here the I blame okay, both, well, right, but idealistic yeah. people. Then, then, then give me the opportunity to say, let's not put labels on the different generations. You did and it these first. Th- All right, well, I'm pulling it back. <laughs> I'm saying there are older people 
and then there are younger people, right? And then wherever you want to draw that line, there is a cultural difference between the two. And that was the clash. Yeah. I kind of felt like they did a good job of also setting up the clash and vision between Michael Lang and John yes. Schur. Not yes. that either one of them comes off as being like really great, but Lang, who was involved in, you know, the original Woodstock and he did the Altamont concert for the Stones and he's just, he's experienced for better and worse in putting on these huge shows. Then you have John Schur, who's a rock promoter basically and his whole thing is like it's his job like i think lang like honestly has this idea that putting on these huge music festivals has some kind of social benefit right there's something to it that's different than some other venture whereas for sure it's like this has got to make money right and i don't think in the first place that that kind of thing, it just didn't seem like it was going to make money, right? It just didn't seem like that was one of the things that was in the cards. But then you had, you know, you have Lang, who's kind of like, everything's fine. You know, there's a yeah. few guys who, you know, got a few few bad seeds or whatever. And then sure, it's just like treading water desperately, just like everything's under control. Like, you know, if we cancel things now, we're going to lose a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> so we got to keep this shit going and we'll cut all the corners we need so we can make some kind of profit margin. That was the moment for me where it stopped becoming about the, the concert goer or the festival goer experience. It was just cutting budgets, cutting budgets. We need to make changes. We're not making profits. Their goal was to make money. I, I think there were mismatched partners, and I'm not sure that any partners who are working together well would have been able to pull something off or made it better. But I think the fact that you had Michael Lang, who sort of seemed like he had sort of stars in his eyes or whatever, and you've got Sure, who's just this like capitalist who looks at this as an opportunity to make a shitload of money, even though that's not really in the cards, you know, I think that sets the scene for having these kids show up ready for something and then depriving them of like water, <laughs> you know, for instance, mm. and selling them food at a rate that they can't afford. And it's just so blatant, right? They're not even pretending, right? It's just like, we yeah. are gouging you for whatever we can gouge. And then finally, you know, the kids weren't stupid. Like they realized it and they got pissed. Huge RV hug in the right lane. Oh, here comes the new Toyota Grand Highlander. That's the Cooper family. Look at them go, Jim. The Coopers are in the clear. With available 362 horsepower hybrid max powertrain, life's grander in the first ever Grand Highlander. Toyota, let's go places. I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Oh, man. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. All right, so Kevin, here we are, your favorite part of the podcast, the business section. How are you feeling for some business, Kevin? I'm ready to tear things down and burn them up. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. After, a, you know, having three days of poopy water to drink. <laughs> oh. Duty water. Duty water. <laughs> How bad could anything we do on Patreon be compared to Woodstock 99, right? Evian doo-doo. Our Patreon will never give you trench mouth. I'll just say <laughs> That's that. That's true. Maybe trench ear, <laughs> but never trench mouth. No, absolutely not. Trench wax. Trench wax. So on Patreon right now, if you sign up at patreon.com slash partners in crime media, you can get almost 300 exclusive podcast wow. episodes of the Crime Writers on After Show, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast, Laura's Leave it to Bricker podcast, and our Married With podcast, where we talk about relationship advice and Things like that. Speaking of the deep dive, Toby, you have a new recording ready to happen. So folks who support us on Patreon at the Crime Writers on Nation level, they not only get to watch Toby record his uh, episodes of the deep dive, but they also can join oh. in, ask questions, come up on the screen. Toby, the book is what? It's When the Moon Turns to Blood by Leah Satilli. 
of Bundyville fame. Mm. And if folks want to uh, watch that happen with uh, your guests, Janet Varney, Amber Hunt, and Sarah D. Bunting, what date should they put on their calendar? So it's September 6th. That is a Tuesday, and it's at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Another thing to put on your calendar, if you're in Dallas on August 26th, we're going to be having, Rebecca and I are going to be having a little meetup. We've got a bunch of Texas-based listeners that want to come by. For information on time and place, just go to crimewriterson.com. We have all the information on the homepage or tweet at us. We'll let you know. Also, one other thing for your calendar. What's that? September 8th, everyone, everyone. We're going to be doing our recording for that week's episode, and we're going to do it live on Zoom for anyone to watch. Public Zoom Public recording? Zoom, yes. Oh, my. For yeah, anyone? Wow. For anyone. That's... Yeah, we had such fun doing it with just our Patreon uh, listeners. We wanted to try one where we could do a big one and Wait, see who comes. And... Is it like a loss leader to try to tempt people to come to our Patreon? Like, look what you get if you if you like see us. It's just audience <laughs> service, Rebecca. Laura, you better be well behaved because you know how this is like. This is the behind the curtain that you can, I know. Yeah, you don't want to, you know people to be like this is lame. <laughs> uh, don't worry, I'll behave. I'll keep my clothes on. Just kidding. <laughs> Toby, you better bring the guns. That's all I got to say. Yep. Gun show. <laughs> Kevin, you better bring the Winnie the Pooh. That's all I got to say. I'm already oh, Winnie pulling it right now. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> all so, right. yeah, so watch for more information at crimewriterson.com or on the socials. Our Facebook group will give you the link, the Zoom link, so that you can join us on September 8th. 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Is this also a good incentive for people to sign up for our newsletters? I bet it's going to be in there, too. It will be. If you want a copy of our uh, weekly free newsletter, just go to crimewriterson.com, stick in your email address. We promise that only aluminum siding salesmen will contact you after us. Not vinyl siding salesmen. No, only aluminum, aluminum siding. It's 1970 all over. <laughs> all right. So does that send the business section? Uh, no, I have more business. Okay, Kevin, do we have any Patreon patron saints yes, in the week? Yes, we this have week? them. Hold on, let's get ready, okay? Yes. Our Patreon patron saints are Audrey Aseri and Jackie Beck. Bless you. Bless you, Audrey and Jackie. Bless you, everyone who's on our Patreon. And bless you, everyone who plans to come to our live Zoom, our Dallas meetup. And bless you to those who don't, who are just listening to this casually and didn't fast forward to the business section. Kevin, I'm going to go ahead and fade that music out right Get rid of it. Now. So I have a question talking about commercialized festivals, right? And I don't know if any of you can answer this because I don't think any of us have been to Coachella or Coachella, as I've heard it pronounced alternatively. No, we're going to uh, Obsess Fest, so keep yeah, going. Yeah, but there are commercial, like blatantly commercial big festivals that people feel good about. And Lilith feel, Fair. Yeah. Live well, Aid. I'm talking about contemporary now, today, oh, right. that people feel good about, they feel good about attending, that feel like events, right? Like Beyonce's like coolest album was an album that was recorded over two nights at I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go with the the uh, the funnier pronunciation, Coachella. Um, <laughs> these are like commercial ventures that people pay lots of money to go to, and they're like, you know. So have we like cracked the code, or have we just decided that altruism and peace, love, and understanding should just not be a part of these fucking ventures anymore? And that was just a dream. To no, begin with. look, because <laughs> there could be problems that you know. Most big festivals, they'd be different. But when you slap the name Woodstock on it, then you're you're selling a brand that means something. So it shouldn't have been so, named that. This could have been named whatever the fuck fest, right? And some of the factors might have been different because some of the people's expectations might have been different. You know, the idea we're all going to show up and get naked. That didn't happen at Live Aid, right? So and there's a reason for that. But we're going to be like, oh, we're going to, you know, do this hippie thing or whatever. The problem is when you called it Woodstock, there was an expectation to that and it created something, you know, it achieved a different kind of effect than it would if this were Farm Aid, right? Or Lollapalooza or Lilith Fair. So that's sort of the problem. We still would have a really interesting documentary if this wasn't named Woodstock, but because it is. It carries a certain burden, and so that there's a, a greater sense of both, you know, irony and hubris that went with it. It's the other, the other big contrast is between what it's called and what the acts that they have mm -hmm. as the headliners are, because corn and lip biscuit have nothing to do with 
the original Matt Woodstock, Jefferson airplane. right? Yeah. You know, it's not. So you've got whatever people are showing up for, you know, a festival of, of peace, love and music. They got Willie Nelson and Cheryl Crow, but the vast majority of people were there to see Limp Bizkit, Corn, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers. I mean, the Chili Peppers, I, I, I think, are kind of in a different situation. But at least the the, two, the headliners of the first two nights, like that, that's it's hard to sort of wedge them into the Woodstock kind of framework just based on what their music is and and what who they appeal to and what their what their message is. Toby, were you surprised to see the dude from Corn actually in this, like talking about the set? Yeah, you know, he's an interesting dude, I guess. Yep. I mean, it was funny because he thought they kicked ass, which, I mean, from his perspective, and he's looking at all those people, he's probably like, oh, yeah. And then at the end, you know, he does talk about how fucked up it is that, you know, women can't go to a concert like that and enjoy it in the same way that that men can, right? That that's counter to, like, the way he envisions things. At the same time... He wasn't doing fucking much to, to help matters when he had the opportunity to, right? There's no drug. There's no nothing on this planet that can give you that fucking feeling of having a crowd in your hand like that. One thing that really struck me about this documentary was how well everybody's memory tracked with what actually happened. And I find it hard to believe that they would like tell the guy from corn like here's how your set went uh-huh. like let watch the video and then repeat like people's memories of this event were like spot fucking on and all of were, it's on youtube it was, a, it was to, a big deal for those guys for yes. everybody the so pe- i want to the people exactly and the attendees that they were able to get for this documentary were perfect so toby i have to ask you about these two guys that they like trucked on out as attendees of the festival. I've renamed them Beavis and Butthead, although their names are Tom and Keith, but legit, they're exactly like Beavis and Butthead. And I guess they found these people. I asked the director about it, like through social media and so forth. But they, are they not like the exemplar, like Woodstock 99 attendees and the perfect people to tell the story about their experience there? At the time, Keith and I, when we were only 16. Love you, mom. <laughs> never been to a concert before. Whoa, I was like, Corn's gonna be there, Limp Biscuit, Rage Against the Machine. I was like, oh my gosh, we gotta go, we gotta go. Tom said, Do you wanna go to Woodstock? Hell yeah, I wanna go to Woodstock. First of all, it's funny that you say Beavis and Butthead because so this is about 30 or 40 miles from where I grew up. And uh, Beavis and Butthead actually in the one scene where they're filling out when they go to the sperm bank to make a donation and they're filling out their stuff. They put their town as Casanova, New York, which is like one town over from where I grew up. So it's like geographically uh, accurate. Yeah, no, I know. I, I thought they did a, a good stand in for people who weren't like huge instigators. But like what, like two dudes who showed up to the thing being like, oh, man, we're going to see these bands we fucking love. There's going to be tons of people. We're going to be partying my ass off. I'm going to do all these drugs and stuff. And it all goes crazy. Um you know, but they still have fond memories of like nostalgia associated with it, right? Yeah, and they're like, you know, would you do it? Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Those were the best, you know, best three days of my life, or whatever. <laughs> Even um, though I got trench mouth, it was awesome. Yeah, I oh, trench mouth, Jesus, that poor woman. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, I thought that was important because in some ways, what you're seeing, and I think rightly so, is the most extreme stuff that happens. I mean, that's what's newsworthy about it. But then what was the experience for just some random person who shows up and isn't like right up front, doesn't see sexual assaults, you know, isn't an instigator and tearing anything down, but it's just in this massive crowd, just experiencing everything. And I thought those guys did a pretty good job of, making an attempt at sort of embodying what it must have been like for the vast majority of people who were there and probably look back and be like, well, it wasn't perfect, but I had a pretty fucking good time. And it's like a memory that will last my lifetime because I'm never going to do anything like it again. Laura Bricker. So we just mentioned one of the key words of this whole documentary, mm-hmm. trench mouth. Ever heard oh. of that before? <laughs> um, 
I have not, I just was thinking as I'm listening to this and watching this, this show, I'm like, you know, I've been to a lot of concerts where you go and you're out in the parking lot for a long time and there's like party, party, whatever, people peeing in the woods, things, you know, gross porta potties you don't want to go in. I have never seen anything as gross as this. And when I ever heard that poor woman describing how she started getting these sores in her mouth and this stuff was happening and they're like, and you have trench mouth. I'm like, that is just right there sums up this entire festival. Like when you see the trash going by and you've got somebody with trench mouth and you you see like naked flea guy on the stage. And, but honestly, the thing, we have a lot of signs that this was just a total shit show and that apparently fits because it kind of was. Um, But it it begins when the mayor of wherever this is happening comes out to like christen this like a ship and break the bottle of champagne with the tie dyed shirt. And that won't even break. That should have been a, another sign right there. The Somebody signs never were handled ignored. a bottle of champagne. It's obviously yeah. not going to. Yeah. The signs were ignored. To me, the signs that were ignored was when on live TV, Cheryl Crow was being sexually harassed and she had to like tell you something, something on live TV, like, like, and she knew it was happening. Jewel had to fucking run off the stage into her bus and like, hey, get the fuck out of here. Like they like, happened to capture the split second where both of those artists, their faces kind of changed and sort of like, hmm, this might go badly. Jewel ran. Yeah. From that festival. Uh, Cheryl Crow in a live interview with MTV was like harassed and was trying to make the best of it because she's a professional Meanwhile, women were getting like sexually assaulted 15 feet away and they could see it. And then they have the scene where like the tower gets just like toppled when they all rush it. That was terrifying. And but every time something like that happens, they just continue it. And that's the part that was insane. Like, okay, now there's a van driving through the rave. We're like, oh, okay, we're just going to pause a little bit. Like, well, I just think that, you know, and if people haven't seen the movie, Give Me Shelter which is about the Altamont concert. It Well, it ends with that, but it's about the Rolling Stones tour in 69 of the U.S., which is, is a great film. I mean, it's better than this, although this is very good. Um, but they, they, they talk a little bit about like what happens if you stop in that situation. And the answer is, well, you see what happens when the concert just ends, right? And that's not, those people aren't feeling like cheated out of the Red Hot Chili Peppers set or whatever. They're just pissed off. If you stop before they started, they played a couple of songs and just left. That's when you have a riot, you know, right. or even more of a riot, like a more predictable riot. So I, th- I think that's part of the, that was part of the issue that they were facing is that you got to kind of keep going or things can get worse. But you know, what's a better idea when things are really bad, Kevin. What? Hand out a hundred thousand candles. Oh Bro, my yeah. fucking God. You have this half maniacal crowd. Boiling hot. <laughs> Boiling hot, oversexed, <laughs> overdrugged, <laughs> under yeah, hungry, haven't been fed. Uh, and you're like and it was beautiful for a couple of minutes. I have an idea. And then let's hand out a hundred thousand uh, candles. Would you pass out candles and to then, your high school graduating class? As we see the fires going, let's ask the red hot chili peppers to calm down the crowd. And what's the song they perform? Fire by <laughs> Jimi Hendrix. Uh, yeah. All good calls. I think the other call might have been to listen to the one guy who was like the same age as all the people who are coming to the, the concert intern. when he's just like, do you know the music of Korn? Do you think that that's a good idea? Order, it's perfect. It's I don't perfect like, minute. Yeah. He's just like, I don't think the order of this lineup was a good idea. Maybe <laughs> like Korn should have been earlier. Right. Today. Maybe <laughs> Willie Nelson at the end to kind of chill people out as they leave. I think yeah. Bush has a tall order in trying <laughs> to like make this all cool now. And then, Poor guy. Yeah. And then the idea that the, you would play this like insane, distorted Hendrix music while flames are going and people are rioting and your idea of like, let's throw on like the most wild distorted music we can possibly find and put it up on the big screen. I mean, it's, it's insanity, you know, but for all the nuttiness and chaos, I found all that stuff, honestly, enjoyable, right? There was a lot of schadenfreude and you're just like, Oh my God, Oh my God, what the fuck? What the fuck? One thing though, that like really, you know, was weighed heavily on me was, you know, you're watching and watching and there's a lot of naked women and they're like crowd surfing. And you're kind of like, for me, I was kind of like, oh, 
They're not safe. I hope they're, are they, are they safe? I, and they don't really touch on it until the very end. Now, I mean, I'm sure some people are like, well, that's really important. The sexual assault should be up front. Saving it to the end, sort of chronologically, because that's when that's when it had that's, that's when they revealed it. That's when it, yeah. it really comes out. Yeah. you know the extent of that. But throughout it, like when I'm seeing it, 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 it sort of like half of uh, towards like the last dark episode, cloud. Yes, yeah, as, as I would see women, you know, crowd surfing. I'd be like, I wonder if they're okay. Now, this is not to say that women shouldn't have been naked or whatever. Consent is consent. They have their own right to say, you know, if you want to walk around naked with body paint. That's not an invitation to get groped. And that was kind of, you know, the, the menace that was hanging over it. For me as a viewer, 20 years later, like, oh, wow, I, I don't think that's a safe space for them. And wasn't John Cher who said there were an acceptable amount of rapes? That was, fuck that guy. What was he trying to say? Statistically speaking, if you're... If it were a city, this is very few. It wasn't a yeah. city. You were in charge. It was an event, not a city. Yeah. But considering there were 200,000 people there, um, it, 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 it wasn't something that gained enough momentum so that it caused uh, any on-site issues, other than, of course, to the, to the women it happened to. Oh, my God. That's that description of the girl in the back of the van. That was one of the most horrific things in this documentary. Yeah. Because she was basically passed out, pants down. That's right. Having just been assaulted. Listen, a city doesn't have a peace patrol. Let's just put it that way. That was so fucking sick. There was <laughs> so the many. Oh. Poor Kyle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I know he was security. Good for him for doing this. But he had an impossible job. Oh, my God. I mean, like 10 of his friends. Here, here's a t-shirt. Here's your grand weather cast. 60 degrees in the driver's seat, in the passenger seat, a high of 66. In the second and third rows, a balmy 70 degrees, just the way grandma likes it. With three-zone automatic climate control, life's grander. In the first ever Grand Highlander. Toyota, let's go places. I never did anything to harm my daughter or my granddaughter. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test. Watch now only on A&E and watch next day on the A&E app. The friendship is sharing deal because I want one of your McNuggets and I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out the three-part documentary, Trainwreck, Woodstock 99 on Netflix? Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Trainwreck? Um, this is this is hard for me. I watched this, like I said in the beginning when we were doing the review. It was a train wreck I couldn't turn away from. It also made me extremely angry at the situation that led this to happen, which is basically the greed of the organizers that allowed it to go on on a freaking tarmac base where it just got worse and worse. So, it, you know, it was three episodes. It was interesting. It was something that, you know, I remember when I think I was just out of college, maybe two years when this was happening. I remember people going that I knew. And I guess I just didn't know what a complete train wreck it really was because I didn't pay too much attention to it until I watched this. So it was, it was interesting. Um, I wish that there was a little more pushing for accountability from the organizers of this who still to this day seem to be sort of like, yeah, whatever, not too much of a big deal. And that part I did find to be a little bit maddening, but overall, I mean, it was interesting. So it's a thumbs up. It's not like a hugely enthusiastic thumbs up, but it's, it's definitely was an interesting documentary. Tell you about what about you? Yeah, I thought this was pretty good. I don't, I must've known about it and then forgot about it, but I, I, I'd sort of I didn't realize that there were two Woodstocks in the 90s, so I kind of, I guess, maybe combined them together. It's interesting what happens. It's a study of kind of crowd dynamics and shitty planning, and I think how hard it is to put on one of these big things, especially when you know, you're not consistent in what you're trying to achieve, like the profit motive versus continuing some sort of legend based on the original Woodstock. So anyway, I thought there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. I thought Laura says they don't push back too much on the organizers and, and they don't, although I think they kind of gave them enough rope to hang themselves. I didn't think they came off very well. 
so anyway, I, I thought it, I thought it was very good, and it's also you know it's recent enough, and it was covered by MTV, so there's a lot of freaking footage. So there's nothing like if they want to show you something, they can show it to you. Um, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I thought it was I thought it was really good. I liked it a lot. So a thumbs up, Kevin Flint. I'm a thumbs up. I think it does a good job of both showing and telling. And because Toby's right, they've got a ton of footage, and they're able to illustrate the points they make. I think this is really a great example of storytelling about, well, I mean, if it's going to be two generations, let's not label them. Let's just say that there was an older generation that uh, thought things should, you know, be one way and did not expect or believe that it could go any differently. And you have this class, this culture clash between two generations. And it's more than that. It's more than just old people and young people. This was a logistical disaster. And so, the violence at the end was completely predictable. But this documentary, I think, just brought all of that home and, you know, almost made rioting seem enjoyable, Hmm. at least enjoyable to watch. Hmm. So I'm a thumbs up. Yeah, I'm a thumbs up, too, for all the reasons that uh, Toby and Kevin said. And for one more reason, which is the main reason I enjoy this, the editing in this was superb. This is a three-day festival, and this documentary was in three parts, day one, day two, day three. Every time anyone on this documentary said something, they had the footage to show it because they had pay-per-view footage, MTV footage, and a tremendous amount of footage from people behind the scenes who had video cameras who were filming everything. They had every source imaginable. They even had Michael Lang, who has since passed away, I guess, since they made this documentary. They had, you know, original Woodstock goers. They had attendees at the festival. This thing was edited perfectly. You had somebody saying, and then Limp Biscuit came out and said... And then you cut to Fred Durst saying the thing. And then the crowd did. And then you cut to the crowd doing the thing. This thing has so much life and energy. And it's a really interesting story, but it's just put together perfectly. And I really love when a documentary is tight because we look at a lot of documentaries in this show that are the opposite of tight. So I love it when they are. So yeah, big thumbs up for me for Trainwreck Woodstock 99. I super enjoyed it. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime of, crime of the week. The week. Walt Disney World was not the happiest place for a group of park goers who got stuck on a popular ride. Video shows the boats on the attraction stalled and one near the exit slowly beginning to sink. But those riders got off easy compared to those in the back of the ride. For more than an hour, the trapped park goers were stuck listening to It's a Small World over and over again. Their world of laughter turned into a world of tears as they sat in near darkness next to 300 culturally problematic animatronic dolls. One described being subjected to the song that long as, quote, torture. Some of us can barely take the saccharine 12 minutes of global peace and international unity. An hour of the cloying song sung in counterpoint by the all but forgotten and lightly compensated Disneyland Boys Choir on an endless loop is enough to make anyone want to storm the border and invade another country. It took nearly 45 minutes for the staff to realize the ride was broken, which seems amazing when no one had gotten off the ride in all that time. The snafu was fixed and the park goers decamped from the tunnel of brotherly love. Unfortunately, no trauma counselors were provided to the riders. I have a lot to say having just ridden that ride a couple months ago. But panel, these folks might need some actual ear bleach to get that song out of their heads. Laura Bricker, how would you try to recover from hearing It's a Small World on a loop for an hour? Um, I mean, I feel like we just had the perfect inspiration in the review we just did. I'm going to say like some Fat Boy Slim, perhaps, um, uh, you know, anything from Woodstock 99 might be the perfect antidote. Toby Ball, what do you think? How would you recover from hearing It's a Small World on a loop for an hour? Yeah, I think I'd put on Nookie by Limp Bizkit and tear, <laughs> tear some shit down. <laughs> Kevin Flynn, what do you think? Oh, I just let it go, Elsa. Oh, my God. That ride. So problematic. I don't, 45 minutes. There are people at the end literally shuttling people off of boats. Like, there's no way they didn't know. 
Maybe John Schur was running it. And you can challenge me. That ride is problematic as hell. The dolls are racist. And then you go in the last room and all the dolls are together and they are all wearing what color? White. It's super weird. All right. That's going to do. But before we go, Laura Bricker, do we have a cat of the week this week? We have a corgi of the week this week. My favorite kind of dog, or at least one of them anyway. I I am also a very big corgi fan. And my dear friend Jason Schreiber has an adorable little corgi named Milo that is his daughter's. And unfortunately, Milo found two $20 bills in the house Mm. and ripped them apart this week. So it is a dog of the week, crime of the week, cautionary tale about corgis. And- what I loved about this is the picture of Milo. Like, you know, the, the face that dogs give you when they know they've done something? Yeah. Well, the face that we interpret as them having known they've done something. Oh, yes. they know. The guilty as bleep bleep face. Well, Milo definitely had the guilty as bleep bleep face when he was busted for the crime of the week. So, um, and then I got all sorts of responses on Twitter of people that like had had similar situations with their dogs um, eating things like that. So, yeah. So here's what I don't like about the Jason Shriver story, okay? So he blamed his daughter for this, which, by the way, it always is a person's fault when a dog yes. eats something. That yes. being said, he could just give his daughter a 40 bucks more and just say, now, you know, but now he's like making it like, I don't know. It just seems like he's being unnecessarily harsh, like 40 bucks. That's like three burritos at Woodstock 99. <laughs> <laughs> That's like two oh, bottles of water at Woodstock 99. But an awful lot of Molly. <laughs> that, that, that shit's free. All right, Laura Bricker, if folks want to pitch to you their animals to be cat of the week, obviously it can be literally any kind of animal. Of course, you can email us at crimewriterson at gmail.com or post on our social media. But if they want to tweet to you, Laura, how can they find you there? They can find me at Laura Bricker. And Toby Ball, if folks want to tweet to you about their memories of Woodstock 99 or their shared love with you of Limp Biscuit, haha, <laughs> just kidding. I know you don't actually love Limp Biscuit. How can they find you on Twitter? At Toby Ball and H. Kevin Flynn, how can folks find you? I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram to share my hatred of Fred Durst, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On, and I encourage you to join our incredible community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular old Facebook page, by the way. Just go there, join that, or look at it, and then hit join the group. The group is awesome. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You get all of our amazing extra content, including the Crime Writers on After Show that you can listen to right now. Plus, Mary with Podcast, Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker Podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the genius, Olivia Burdett. The executive producer of this fine program is sitting right next to me and I don't remember his name. This show was it's recorded in the yoga loft above Flynn. the bodega in Bay St. Louis. Why? Mississippi Studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our New Hampshire basement where we both stare at each other, waiting for the other one to pick up the goddamn trash. On behalf okay, of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. Later. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this This. (laughs) is Jeopardy! (laughs) (laughs) All right, take that again. (laughs) I actually literally think that literally every time I say this. I literally every single time think this. You do that for, uh, you can't make this up, too. Only because you wrote it that way. It's Okay, ready? Yeah. Media. Huge RV hug in the right lane. Oh, here comes the new Toyota Grand Highlander. That's the Cooper family. Look at them go, Jim. The Coopers are in the clear. With available 362 horsepower hybrid max powertrain, life's grander in the first ever Grand Highlander. Toyota, let's go places.